Now, there's, there's quite a bit of debate about whether intervention actually does help people recover from addiction. That's not what, our, our, that's not what is, is up for debate tonight. What we're concerned about, what we're always concerned about as God's children, is what concerns him. And he says what concerns him is us. The fact that we are natural born addicts. We're substance abusers by birth. We're, we're addicted to a substance that can, can rip a marriage in half. We're users by nature of a poison. And it's a poison that can hurt our bodies. It can eat away at our minds. By, by, by birth, we're just naturally compelled. We're under the compulsion and controlled by a desire to make decisions that has no care or concern for anyone else's life and how those consequences might affect them. All we're caring about is ourselves. That's what our addiction is, my friends. We're natural-born addicts to me. My addiction is me. That's kind of the way God describes it, isn't it? I, I'm going to share a verse with you from Ephesians. Listen to how God describes us when we're born into this world. He says, all of us, through the Apostle Paul, all of us lived gratifying the cravings of our flesh in following its desires and thoughts. So God says, my addiction is me. I'm addicted to me. And it has lethal consequences because he goes on to say, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That, that, there's a powerlessness to that. By nature, we deserve the ultimate end, which is, which is death. And I, I suppose it's kind of like the way that a mother who, who abuses substances has kind of set her child on a path that it has no control over. Right? If as a parent, we abuse alcohol or drugs or, or, or anything else, then really the child has no say in the matter. You can argue all you want whether it's the child's fault or not. You can argue till you're blue in the face, but the fact is those substances are going to affect that child's life. And it never has a say in, in, in the matter. It's going to suffer the consequences of abuse and it hasn't even been born. That's how we are when we're born into this world. We're powerless to step away from the consequences of sin. We were born addicts. And God says to us tonight, that took place before we were born. It took place all the way back in, in of all places, and this fits with our Lenten theme this year, it took place of all places in a garden. And you know the story really well, right? It's a tragic story. People born of privilege in a nurturing and loving family. They had every, Adam and Eve had everything. But the first time they were presented with an alternate path, they took that one. They put, took the path that led to what they thought was bettering themselves. And the minute they took that drug, it had an immediate effect. And, and the drug, I suppose, you could argue, isn't even the fruit, is it? The fruit wasn't the drug. It was the choice that they made that was the drug. They chose themselves instead of the life God had planned for them, the life they were already enjoying. And the problem with that drug, my dear friends, is that it is immediately addictive. Remember, God had warned them of that. He said, if you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. I know what's going to happen to you as soon as you, as soon as you taste it. And so from the first moment that they tasted that forbidden fruit, they wanted more. They wanted more life for themselves. And it's, it's kind of surprising because they had just enjoyed and just experienced the, the, the healthiest lives that have ever been lived on this earth. 
They had just enjoyed God's family, uh, interpersonal relationship with him. But they couldn't help wanting more. You, you see it play out in the way that they act with each other. They start to blame each other. They're on the defensive. They're trying to hide from God. All of a sudden, there's fear and defensiveness and insecurity. You see what happens immediately? And they're powerless to interrupt that cycle. The Bible says that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sin. That just, that just proves the power of sin, right? It just renders human beings powerless. And so we enter this life unable to pull out of the tailspin. Our, our, our lives from birth are destined for death. Separation from our God. See, what we needed was an intervention. I mean, someone who really loved us. Who's willing to step in on our behalf and act on our, in our best interests because we aren't able to. And ironically, your intervention took place all the way back in that very same garden. When God stepped in and showed his great love for his precious sons and daughters. Remember how he acted? It was decisive. It was immediate. He said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. You hear, can you sense God's anger? There's, a, there's, a, there's an anger in his tone there. You can kind of get the sense of that. Just reading those words. And you sense God's direction. He's acting to save. And you also get a sense for what's going to happen in that act of saving. There's going to be some pain. There's enmity, and there's crushing, and there's striking. There's going to be some, some pain, because the truth of the matter is, interventions are always painful. And they're always difficult. When you confront someone you love with a problem, very often, immediately, there's defensiveness, and hurt, and guilt. And God did some confronting, didn't he? But the confronting God did in his intervention on our behalf, it isn't the confronting that you think. You'd expect him to confront the people who sinned, Adam and Eve, and he does. He goes to Adam and Eve, but you know what happens? Nothing. Because remember, human beings are rendered powerless in their sin. So even if God had confronted Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve didn't have the power to interrupt their sin. They didn't have the, the, the willpower to even want to change. And they didn't. They didn't even have the will to acknowledge their sin to God. They tried to hide it and blame it. They didn't even have the desire to, to sever the relationship, that, this new friendship they'd formed with Satan. They were powerless to do anything. So the real confrontation that took place was God confronting Satan. The pusher. The drug pusher. The one who sold to God's precious son and daughter a, a bold-faced lie. A lie that was poisonous and lethal and toxic. And so God confronts him. That's where the intervention takes place. He steps between humankind and its enemy. And God says, I will put enmity. I'm going to make you enemies again. Almost as soon as they had become friends, God says, uh-uh. You're going to be enemies again, and I'll send a he who will crush your head, Satan. The intervention God 
enacted on our behalf was a powerful promise all the way back in the garden. The promise to send a descendant who would be able to do what no human being had ever been able to do. To interrupt the cycle of abuse. And that's precisely what Jesus did. Really what he did was he intercepted all the consequences that lifelong strung out users and addicts of themselves should suffer. Jesus intercepted all the consequences, took them on himself. That's why during Lent we see him go to the cross, forsaken by his Father. Because he suffered the ultimate result of that abuse. He intervened on our behalf so that you and I would never have to suffer. See, our story is a little bit different than the typical traditional addict story. Harmful decisions, hurtful consequences, broken relationships. We don't suffer the ultimate consequence. Jesus did. And that's why God can say to you and me, you're forgiven. You're back within my family. I've rescued you. You're saved. In that garden, that's where it began. Our addiction began there, and God's intervention began there, where He stepped between us and Satan and said, You're back home. You're back in my family. And the beautiful thing about God's promises, there's always wonderful results. Not only have we been rescued, but you know what? God says, I've set you on the path to recovery too. See, when God made his promise of a Savior, what he did was he recaptured the hearts of his lost children and brought them back into his fold. He recreated their desire. Adam and Eve, for the first time since their sin, Love their God again. And they were so grateful to him and thankful that he would be so gracious to them. That's the power of God's promise. It recaptures lost hearts. It lifts up broken hearts. That's God's promise to you too. Adam and Eve, they heard the promise and they wanted to share the promise with their children. They wanted to live again to His glory. That's what God does. He interrupts that cycle of death and destruction and makes new people again. People who are no longer powerless. God's promises to be the power working through them, He says. He works in us to will and to do to His glory. You know what that means for you? That you're, that you're in His recovery program? You know what that means? You really can now, as God's forgiven child, you really can put your husband's needs ahead of your own. You really can say no when that, that, that pop-up ad that is a little risque but very tempting, that pop-up ad screams up on your screen in the middle of your work. You can really say no to that. By God's grace, you have the power to actually Truly be happy for your friend when they're enjoying some measure of success in their life. You don't have to be jealous. You can really rejoice with them that God's blessing them. You can have a loving, gentle conversation with someone who's wondering about the hope that you have. You can share with them the certain hope you have in Jesus. Why you're going to live in heaven. And it doesn't have to be defensive or argumentative. You can just lovingly share the wonderful peace God's given to you and the wonderful peace He promises everyone. You truly have the power by God's grace to live as recovering addicts. People who no longer have to care so much about themselves. Who are really invested in the lives of others. That's an incredible story, don't you think? 
Your story, the story of addiction and rescue, it happened all the way back in a garden. Addiction, intervention, recovery. That's really what we're going to be seeing all through the weeks of Lent together. What God was willing to do for people He loves. To do the difficult thing. To suffer, die, and then powerfully rise. To prove His power over our addiction. Just enjoy walking with your Savior to the cross this season. Enjoy seeing your story on full display. Enjoy appreciating your Father's love. And I guess the argument about is intervention an effective way to help people on the road to recovery? You know what? That argument can take place somewhere else by someone else. All we know is our story. And it's a story of God's intervention. And man, is it a good one. God bless the rest of your Lenten season. Amen. With our grateful hearts, we respond with gifts of love to our Savior.